Oops, I forgot to turn the camera on myself. I had it on the desk view when I started. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is uh, the first of what I hope will be a whole series of question and answer videos where I just kind of get on and freewheel a discussion about a particular topic and allow you to answer questions. Um, I'm always unsure about the audio. So if somebody can give me a thumbs up that the audio is okay and that you're hearing me properly. Um, I've got the little control panel there that says the numbers are moving around. So hopefully that means that the sound is being broadcast. I hate the idea of talking to dead air and then having to come back and um, fill all of that in. So while I'm waiting for somebody to give me a thumbs up on the audio, I'm not sure where most of my students are coming from. When I was just one of those um, artists that was doing classes on the side, people would stumble across me on Pinterest. And that was mostly paper crafters. And you've got a different mindset about markers than um, probably a group that is coming from the anime field or from the um, fine art department. So hopefully you can um, kind of let me know in the comments where you're coming from. I I'm here to color cards. I'm here just to use the Copic markers better. Or maybe you're more interested in the fine art stuff, which is where I come from. Because it helps to know where the YouTube audience is coming from. I kind of knew where the Pinterest audience was coming from, but YouTube is like this whole new game for me. So I'd really love, I go back and I read those comments and I want to know where you're coming from because that helps me structure these Q&A sessions um, to topics that are relevant to you. I want to make sure that we're always covering things that you want to hear about. Um, I've got a lot of art and marker experience. I'm 54 years old and I've been doing this since college. So um, I'm not ashamed of that. Actually, I'm 53. I will be 54 in March, though. So, yeah, I'm not somebody who just decided 10 years ago to pick up a Copic marker. I've got some history with this, um, some history with the company, not necessarily with the company, but watching the company. Um, so just to start it off, today we are going to discuss the Copic numbering system. And I'm going to decode that for you because... I think the current interpretation, which is very popular in paper crafting, so card makers, people who use coloring books, and people who are coloring in art journals now, I think you guys are held back, held down by the Copic numbering system, and it's unnecessary. And by the way, um, right there, yeah, I have put a little timer over there because I want to keep these relatively short. Um, so I put a little 30 minute timer over there just to give me a, a rough estimate of how long we're going. I don't mind going over it, especially if you have lots of questions, but I do want to keep my presentation pretty, pretty in that 30 minute time frame. So, okay. So for starters, um, my name is Amy Schulke. You can find me at vanillaarts.com, but I also have a beginner website and that beginner website, um, you can see it written on like down at the bottom there is markernovice.com. And I started that website to answer basic marker questions. So if you're a brand new beginner, please check out markernovice.com. And then if you're interested in more of the fine art stuff, then you can catch me over at vanillaarts.com where I talk more about mindset and approach rather than the mechanics of coloring. And they're both a work in progress. Um, the websites have areas that I've covered really well and areas that I haven't really co covered well because I teach mostly full-time. And you can find that at vanillaworkshops.com. So that's kind of my background. Um, I'm a technical illustrator, which means that I do object studies. Um, I worked freelance for about 20 years um, and markers were part of that. I have been working with art markers since 1989. And I know that date, it's like cemented in my head not because of the markers itself, but because I graduated high school in 1989. And then in the fall of 89, I went and um, t started art school. And the very first class that I had to take was called marker indication, which they were teaching us how to use art markers. So I go back with markers 
to the eight to the late eighties. Um, it's just it's been a tool of the trade, and I and I would be, it would be wrong for me to say I I that I love markers. I hated them in school. I absolutely hated them, but they were a different thing back then, and we'll cover that just a little bit. Um, but we we used markers. It was called marker indication, and we used it for basically sketching and drawing. And it was a required part of a graphic arts degree. I went for illustration, and so I had to take marker courses because markers are a fundamental tool. So it wasn't something that I loved. I don't jump out of bed every morning saying, yay, it's another day I get to use markers. That's It's a tool of the trade. It's not my passion. Colored pencil, that's more my passion. So I'm kind of, you know, a fish out of water here teaching something that isn't really my passion, but it is a tool that I use and I've used for many years. I have had a chance to watch Copic from the very beginning. At first, it was a marker that somebody brought back from Japan in their suitcase. And we all looked at it and we all thought, ooh, how cool. And then they kind of fell off our radar for a while because they were not available here in the U.S., once they started selling them, then the studios that I worked in all started um, building up their own marker collections, which I used. It took me a long time to personally collect a lot of markers. So I am not one of those people that just went out and bought 358 markers at once. Just like you, I collected them slowly over time and I relied on borrowing markers from work really, really, really long. I do have some notes over on the side, so if you see me glancing over there, that's what I'm looking at. Okay, so Copic used to issue yearly catalogs, and I was on the mailing list. So I have seen how their literature and their explanation about the Copic numbering system has changed over the years. Yes, they used to send out 20-page, I think it was called a guidebook or maybe a lookbook or something, but it was basically... Um, it was basically a catalog. It was showing you the numbers and everything else. And once again, if you see that timer over there, right here, um, that's just telling me a 30 minute discussion. So um, don't worry about it. I can even move it down a little bit if it's bothering people. Um, I just thought it would be helpful to have that timer clicking over there on the side to let us know how long, let me know how long I've been talking. Okay, so got those catalogs in the mail. And um, I could see year by year what was happening. When Copix first started, it was a company for artists by artists. And those catalogs gradually morphed and changed over the years as the marketing teams took over. And the language got garbled. And the website, I don't know if you've been to Copic website, that thing changes constantly. I convinced every intern that comes into that company changes the website. And it's always written poorly. And I don't know if it's the translation from the Japanese, but they use art terms wrong. So my, my explanation here is not Copic sanctioned. It is what I have observed over the years from personal use. And from my art background, just knowing how art supplies work and how this company has changed. Um, so it's not a, what I'm about to say today is not a Copic sanctioned thing. And honestly, if Copic sees this and sends me an email and says, you're wrong about A, B, and C, okay, that's fine. Because what I'm telling you today is practical knowledge, not knowledge that I've been given from Copic or that is their official wording. Because a lot of what I'm gonna say today does not conform to what you find on the site. It just, it doesn't match. And I think it's because Modern Copic is a marketing team. The artists are not there anymore. It's they're selling markers now instead of developing markers. And that's a totally different mindset. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful company. And I'll probably stick with it all of my life and at least have those Copics by the side there because Copics did something really wonderful for artists. And I do, paper crafters and card makers and coloring book people, you're late to the party by about 20 years. These markers were not designed for crafters. They were not designed for blending. They're not a blending marker. It's kind of like, sometimes listening to my students is a little bit like listening to my kids. And one of my kids, not kidding, 
Um, one of my teenagers once told me, you know, it would be really great if they invented a television that like got free programs on it. So like all you had to do was buy the TV and come home and plug it in and then it would play free programs. And like if that didn't work, like they could pay they could like fund the television, the free television programs by like maybe doing ads and, and product placements. Really? Yeah, that would be a great idea. That's sometimes a little bit how I feel with the students because you think that Copics just started like 10 years ago. There's an art history here. What you don't realize is that a long time ago, back when I started with those markers, back in 1989, this is not my set. This is a set that I found off of eBay, but I had I had this same tray. I had most of these colors. It's like a trip down memory lane there. These were called design markers, um, and it was a product of uh, Eberhardt Faber. And the, this is what art markers looked like back in the 1980s. And these were chisel nibbed only, single nib. There's not another nib down at the bottom there. They were only the chisel nib, and it was a different kind of chisel nib. It was a big, fat one. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about it the other day. The only pointed nibbed marker, like a bullet nib or anything like that, was for lettering class, and it was a black marker. That was the only one that came pointed. Everything was chisel nibbed. So that's what the markers look like. So why don't we use these markers today? Well, because those were not alcohol markers, they were xylene markers. Xylene is a known carcinogen now, but markers have been around since the 1950s and they didn't realize how bad it was. It causes nerve damage, it causes kidney damage, and I kid you not, in art school, the marker classes had to be held in a room that had special ventilation. Because if you get 40 people in one room using xylene-based markers, after about five minutes, everybody gets the giggles. We were drunk on markers. And even with the ventilation, I can remember feeling a little bit tipsy in marker classes because the ventilation didn't work as well as it was supposed to. So Copic came along and said, we're taking out the xylene. We're taking out the tooling, I think is how it's pronounced. There was like six carcinogenic ingredients in these markers that I have been exposed to. It was only a short while before I moved. Like, I know guys, I know art designers who worked with xylene-based markers for 40 years. So Copic did something amazing, and this is why they have my heart, because they were the first ones to come out and say, we don't need to use these carcinogenic additives and ingredients. They were the first ones to develop a safe marker. And that is just, I cannot express to you, like I'm almost feeling teary when I talk about that because it was such a big development. And that's why all of a sudden we all jumped off of the design marker um, chart pack was another version that I had a mixed combination of those, but we all jumped off the chart pack bandwagon and we all got rid of our design markers and we switched over to Copic because it didn't cause cancer. Really important thing there. So the fact that they were refillable was great. That was a wonderful development. The fact that they had this numbering system was another good development, but they didn't cause cancer. And that was just wonderful. It opened up a new world for people because you didn't have to worry about, do I have the window open in December to give myself some fresh air? So that is why I stay very loyal to Copic because you know they just, they did such an amazing thing for the illustration and design community. It's just, it was really important. But you have to understand that the purpose of the Copic was it was a safe marker. Not that it was a blending marker. I didn't see anybody blend until after the year 2000. And then I was like, oh yeah, I, I kind of do that sometimes. But blending wasn't like this big thing. It's something that is popular in the crafting world, but Copic didn't design their numbering system to be for blending. It's something that you guys have kind of added onto the system. Okay. so. They're not a luxury brand, they were a safe brand. And that's really what I wanted to, to stress there. So since they were not invented for blending, 
the numbering system doesn't work as well for blends as you have been told. It's, it's just, and, and the numbering system explanations are like a game of telephone because this person hears a good explanation and they tell person B and then person B tells person C who then makes a video about it or writes a blog article. And that information from the marketing department has gotten garbled over the years. The numbers are not about the color. So I've got, let's see. I pulled out some of my marker art just to show you some of the stuff that can be done with markers. And I work as a mark combination of marker and pencil. So this is a recent project. Here's a recent project. And I do work with photorealism with my advanced students. This was a Christmas one from a couple of years ago, but I'm just showing you that I know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these markers. There's a history here that I have of using these markers for things other than card fronts, but that does change how I teach the classes. Okay, so I have this marker here. It is, I just pulled it out randomly. It's a Y17, but that Y is not telling you that this is a Y marker. It's not telling you that it's yellow. It's not, it's, it's a misinterpretation of the system. So here, let me put this over here. This is my color collection. Um, this is every, I have all 358. This is my color collection, just the colors. And then I also have another container that has, it has a full row of the browns. Um, I can't get it all on camera at once. And it has a full row of grays. And then, well, here, let me just show you my other, other box. So here's the other box. These are commercial display units. So, yep, here's the, this is what a whole collection looks like. It fills two of the commercial display units. Um, this was really intended to just store four of one color for a store to display. And the catalogs went here. So this is how they used to be. And I think Hobby Lobby used these for a while. Um, I use my markers, or I haven't got my Copic Safe pins. And then these are refills that I use a lot of. And yes, I'm still working off the old refills in many cases, because when they discontinued those, I bought up a bunch of them. Okay, so that's the Copic collection there. Um, but the numbers here are not telling you about the color family. What the numbers are telling you is about the marker chemistry. And that's the biggest thing that I think crafters who are coming at this, and I don't mean crafters as a derogatory term. I love crafting. I do crafting. My mother, my grandmother, I'm family of crafters. So I don't mean it as a mean thing. I'm just saying that there is a different approach to crafting. And I think you, you came along and you said, oh, B must stand for B. And BG must, you know, there's like this whole mythology about what this stuff means. It's not. This is about chemistry, not about colors, the number system. All right, so... I'll pull this back a couple of times during the demonstration just to show you why the standard explanation doesn't work. But let me pull out, where did I put it? Oh, here we go. Okay, so Copic was developed for artists. And so what Copic said was, we already have numbering systems in existence. Let's build on that. So these are watercolor. And if you look at any professional watercolor label, what you'll find is a series of numbers. I can tighten up here maybe, but it's, the numbers are small. Whoop. Let me go back. Can you kind of see the numbers right there? So what this is telling me is that in this tube, there is a mixture of P073, PY65, and PW6. That's what's in this tube. In this tube, and I'm sorry if the focus goes wonky on you. So this is a tube of ultramarine blue paint. And in this tube, there's just one ingredient. Well, there's more ingredients than one, but there's only one pigment, PB29. Now they all start with P, that stands for pigment. And then blue is the blue pigment that's in here. So PB and then number 29. Copic was mimicking this numbering system that is it exists on watercolor. Um, you'll find it on some of the better grades of acrylic paint, but you'll definitely find it in oil color. They tell you exactly what's in the tube on the label. 
and Copic wanted to do the same thing for you. So when they came up with their numbering system, they started, remember that pigment blue in here, and then a number, and that's what they're trying to copy. Now they dropped the P because Copics are not made with pigment. Copics are made with dye, and dye is slightly different. Dye is transparent. Pigment is like a gritty mineral. Um, it would clog up markers, which is why every time they've tried pigment markers, it doesn't, they don't last as long or work as well. So dye was an important thing. And that's what they're telling you is what's in there. Okay. So yes, it's true that the G stands for green and the Y stands for yellow. And the B stands for blue. That's kind of obvious. Those are the marker families there that we're used to. But then where the system gets screwy, where the def where the explanation gets screwy, is you guys look at the BV and you say, oh, well, that must mean blue-violet. That's not what Copic is telling you. Copic is not telling you the color. They're telling you the ingredients. So in your blue violet marker, if there's two letters, if it's a BV marker, they are telling you that in this marker, there is blue ink. And in this marker, there is violet ink. Now the fact that you look at that and you say it's blue violet, that doesn't mean that that's what the, the code is there to tell you what ink is in the marker. Always remember that it's not the color. The code is the chemistry. So I've heard a lot of people say, well, they don't call the YR markers orange because it would be an O, a letter O sitting next to like a, an O, O, O marker or an O, zero, zero, because that would be confusing. No, that's not what they're telling you. They're telling you there's some yellow ink in here and there's some red ink in here. It's a combination. And the reason why that's important to me as an artist, when I am coloring something like this that does not use standard blending combinations, I need to know that my marker is a combination of inks. Because if I hit that with too much solvent, too much colorless blender, and we'll get to that in a bit, if I hit this marker with too light of a marker, it's going to shatter. It's going to separate into its yellow ink and its red ink, which means I could be two hours into coloring something and all of a sudden it breaks apart. So they're telling you the chemistry. They're telling you that this is a mix. Now, in my classes, we always lovingly refer to the drunk guy at the factory. And he worked for Copic and he went in there and kind of messed things up. I really do think that the, the numbering system works until it doesn't. There are all these little exceptions to the rules. So every once in a while you'll find something that doesn't work according to the plan. And they have added single ingredient orange inks. I have a whole testing series. I showed it to you earlier. The uncapped system that is over there on MarkerNovice.com. That is... You see the circular test? There's like four colors across and then there's five down and there's a circle up there. I'm showing you which ones will shatter into a combination. And BG09, when it shatters, you're going to get hints of green and hints of gold along with the original blue. So that's one of the reasons why I started doing the testing of the markers was because I wanted to know, okay, which one of these actually shatters and which one of them got lumped into the blue green family because it's blue green instead of that it is B ink plus G ink. Hope I'm saying this all clearly. All right. So that's what those letters mean. It is telling you the dye that's in the ink. So a big mistake that colorers make is that you look at those at those num you look you think about ink in general let me start this over again the big mistake that you make is that you think of ink copic ink as a lot of solvent and then you kind of think of it like Kool-Aid like you pour water into the pitcher and then you put some cherry in or you put some strawberry in or some lemon in that's not really how marker inks work though yes they all have solvent as the base but every single ink or dye that they put in there, 
makes the marker behave totally differently. So this Y17 is not going to react on paper the same way as BV29. These guys are totally different colors, totally different markers, totally different ink formulas. So that's why Copic is separating them for you. Because you need to know that this BV25 guy, if you hit him, with some colorless blender. I've gotten hints of pink out of this. I've gotten hints of green. Copic ink is not universal. It is 358 children and you need to learn how to manage them all. And that's what the, co the numbering system helps us do. It helps us spot patterns so that we know that if it's a BV2, it's probably gonna shatter. And I just happen to know that Y17 here, um, doesn't like it's a cuckoo bird it doesn't fit into its regular group there's the exceptions and that's why i tested them all all right so we talked about the the letters the letters are not telling you the color they're telling you the chemistry the numbers are telling you the ingredients so think back to those paint codes pb 29 i think it was on the ultramarine blue there that was telling you where that pigment was sourced from. Now, in Copic, when you look, you've got the letters and then that first number. People talk about that being desaturation or saturation, and it's not. What is saturation? Well, saturation is purity of color. So if you think about the rainbow, if you think about the rainbow, like imagine just reaching up your hand and grabbing a handful of color. You just can't handful of color from the rainbow. That's a hue. Um, and then to desaturate it, you add something else to it. You could add white, you could add black, you could add gray, you could add green. Desaturation just means a hue that has been contaminated somehow. And a lot of card makers will tell you that well like okay here is the yg family and they will say that the yg zeros are the most saturated so they're the most pure and then the yg1 family here is a little bit more desaturated it's less pure and then as that number gets higher the color gets uglier or dirtier or more desaturated and that's kind of true until it isn't because look at those y family here very clean colors here in the y zeros very clean colors here in the y teen family so y1 but then you get to the y twos and this is about the world's ugliest marker it is dirty it is desaturated and then the next y is another clean color so that blows that theory. The first number is not desaturation. The first number is about the ingredient. What they do is they have room for 10 colors of red and 10 colors in the numbering system. You can start with zero and go all the way up to nine. They have 10 blues. And the chemist just says, this is like the master ink color. The chemist just says, okay, this is number one and this one is number two, and this one is number three. Now, in general, they did put the dirtiest colors down at the end, but that's not totally true in every single family. So you can't say that the higher that first number, the more, what people say, the more gray the color is. It's not true because the Y28 is more gray than Y38. So it's that's not true. It's just that that's the family that it came from. So let me write this down so that you can see what I'm talking about. You have the letter and I'm just going to put L for letter. And then that first number, let's just give it a three. Okay. So this is our imaginary marker number. This number right here is just the source ink. It's the ink that they make everything else from. So. Let me grab a good family for this, the 29. The chemist starts with the master ink, the source ink, and he calls it, it's in the blue family, so he gives it a B, and he calls it ink number two. That's just all it is, it's just the source ink. 
B39 comes from ink number three. So he takes this B2 and it's full strength and he adds a little bit of colorless blender to it and he makes a 2.8. And then he takes the 2.8 and he adds a little bit of colorless blender to it and he makes a 2.7, which they don't make. So he added a, this is a missing color, but it has a space there. At one time we thought Copic was gonna fill in all the holes. At one time Copic sounded like they were gonna fill in all the holes, but they haven't. They got to 358 and they said, we're done. So add a little color splendor to the 2.9 and you get a 2.8. Add a little bit more and you get a 2.7. Add a little bit more, you get a 2.6. Add a little bit more and you get a 2.5. And then a 2.4. See how, what we're doing here is a dilution scale. 2-3, we've added a little bit more colorless blender. 2-1, even more colorless blender. So this is a dilution rate. That's the last number. The last number isn't value. The last number isn't saturation. The last number isn't brightness or clarity or any of those other colors that card makers have assigned to it. What it is, is the dilution of that source ink. So the first number tells you what the source is. And then the last number tells you the dilution rate. So this marker here has more solvent in it than this marker. This marker is more colorant than solvent. And this marker is more solvent than colorant. So it all makes sense once you understand what you're working with. So run through my notes here. Okay, so the last number there actually does work on a scale and the old Copic literature used to tell you the scale. What I've done here is I've just taken my gray markers here. The N series is what they use. The value of the N series is their standard, the measuring scale. So a B29 here measures a nine on the Copic value scale. So does a BV29, unless the drunk guy has gotten there, because that looks a little bit off to me. But in theory, in a perfect world, here's a four nine. These guys are all the same value. And that includes colors that you don't think are as dark like a Y19. These are all the same value because Copic has used their N grays as the value scale. So here's a BV02. It measures the same as an N2. I'm not gonna try and put all of these back in order. A Y02 measures the same you can go through your whole Copic collection and do this. You can match the last number to the value scale here set up by the ends. Okay, so Alex is ask, asking a really good question. I'll go through here and get those questions later. He does point out that the Olo, Olo is the first company that I found that after Copic that has made a numbering system that makes sense. I love the Olo uh, numbering system. I have some Olos here, actually have them. I bought just a small selection of Olos. I'm thinking about testing them for the summer. I only test markers in the summer because I use natural sunlight and I wanna make sure that I'm testing them all in similar conditions. So I'm thinking about working with the Olos, maybe adding them to my Copic collection. But Olo is the first marker company that has made sense with their numbering system. Um, since Copic. And it's not a surprise that Olo was kind of started by people who had ties to Copic. So um, they did a really good numbering system. But um, Alex's comment here that uh, popped up is, if the first number is the source ink, why do some markers like the VO all seem to be different? And that's an important point because Copic does not control for temperature. Temperature is not a factor on the Copic value system there. So what you're seeing in the V family is some very pinkish purples 
and also these are warm and then some also some cool purples and they've all gotten lumped in to the V family. So um, V05 Source Ink 0, V25 Source Ink 2. This one just happens to be cool and this one happens to be warm and they don't put them in order. And that drives me crazy because the reds are not in order, the blues are not in order, and there's one of those cat math things where you just add two to the first number. I don't know, I don't pay attention to this stuff, but card makers have this system where you add one or you add 10, I don't know, somebody could explain it to me, but they have you jump around using cat math and you're jumping from temperature to temperature, so it doesn't work and it makes nastiness when I see it happening. I can always tell that somebody's, it's a 10 plus two system, that's what it is. So if you wanna find a partner for V05, you add 10 plus two. So the, the next marker that you would blend it with is a V17, which I happen to have right here. I would never combine those two unless I was drunk because this is warm and this is cool. The, the cat math only works until it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, it doesn't work really, really badly. Um, Deirdre is, ask, Deirdre is asking, is there a way to tell light fat, fastness? That's what I test with um, this uh, system here. The uh, very bottom one. So you got those four across, that tells you the layering. And then the five squares down, that bottom one shows you how light fast it was over a period of three weeks in natural sunlight. Um, I have found, I've always known that Co Copic is, it's dye based. Nothing dye based is ever going to be light fast. So your Copic art will not last a hundred years. It won't last three weeks if you hang it in bright sunlight or even under fluorescent lights. I've had work fade under fluorescent lights in stores. Um, so we know that they're not light fast. But when I went to, I started testing Ohuhu markers and I gave up. I always thought Copic was bad about fading because I would look at like the fading there of the BG09. And you can see the top part is what the swatch started at. The bottom part is what it faded to after three weeks. And I always looked at that and I said, oh my gosh, that is so terrible. And then I looked at some of the fade rates that I was getting on Ohuhu markers. So here's some of my test results with the Ohuhu. And I don't mean to disparage the company. It's a bargain marker and you get what you pay for. So here's how I test the layering and I test the staining and I test for the shattering and I was getting some awful results with the shattering. But here's the light fastness stuff. And Ohuhu was fading across the board. That's three weeks. That's the same amount of testing that I, I couldn't get this kind of fade out of Copic if I hung it up there for nine months. This is just ridiculous. So I stopped testing them because they're really, really, really not light fast. Copic, not light fast. Some of these other brands, really, really, really not light fast. So yes, I do test for the light fastness. And that's all part of the um, Copic Uncapped series. Um, and what I do is I hang those swatches up in natural light because I figure that's the same thing you would do when you were hanging them up on your fridge. So I'm doing the real life testing. There is a blue wool scale that you could apply to it, but I don't get that in depth because I don't want to pay for scientific um, uh, analysis to have that done. Copic should be doing that if, if they really wanted to market a light fast marker. Okay, so back to that number. Let's pop that up there to refresh your memory. So the first number is telling you the general hue that it came from, and then the two letters is telling you the ingredients that are in that marker. So YR is a combination of yellow ink and red ink. The first number is telling you the source ink, and it doesn't have anything to do with saturation or anything else. The only thing that I have noticed is that the zero markers tend to be the cleanest, most saturated color. And there's a simple reason for that because the zero inks are the ones that they use to make the sub zeros from. So 
the YR02 with a little bit of colorless blender in it is a YR01 and then YR00 and then 0000. They want the cleanest color to make these sub zeros, these really super light markers. So the Y or the the zero family, Y0, R0, those tend to be the cleanest, most saturated color, but that's the only thing that's true from color family to color family across when you're talking about that first number. Then the second number is the dilution rate, which yes, you can say that the 99s are darker than the 93s, but it's really telling you how much solvent is in that marker. Now, as you're working with color, or as you're working with Copic colors, every once in a while, you will come across a marker. I'm trying to think of one. Um, YG21 is one. Okay, so you get this YG21 here. And I'm just grabbing a marker at random here, a B24. And I'm going to put down a good coat of B24. Okay, so that's B24. And you'll find that you're trying to make some of these interesting blends. And you hit it with a particular marker like the YG21. And it, it immediately starts to snow plow through there. And as this starts to cure... There's going to be a dark coat. You're going to find like a dark line on this side and a dark line there. It's eating away at the color. And so I, with my students, it's not an official name, but I call some of these markers a super eater. And what this is, is that the parent ink, so the YG2 ink was so thick and so strong that it took a ton of colorless blender to take this YG21 all the way down to a level N1. This marker is super saturated. There's a ton of solvent in it. And you need to know these super eaters because they damage your coloring. When you're, you're coloring along and you've got a nice three color blend going and you add a super eater at the bottom and then you give everything a coat of that super eater and your color goes away and you're like, what happened? It's because you're dealing with a hyper solvent marker. So occasionally you come across them. I used to publish a list of the super eaters. I don't anymore because we were starting to have arguments over whether something was a super eater and I didn't have the official answer from Copic. So I just kind of took that list down because it was debatable. But anytime you've got a marker that snow plows its way through everything else, maybe put some washi tape on it and just know that that's a marker that can do some serious damage because it is hyper loaded with the solvent in it. It is also a super eater, but it's not as bad. YG03 has a ton of solvent in it. This marker will play with anyone. I've blended it with black before. So having that solvent there is good if you know it, but if you hit it out of the blue every once in a while, it can do some damage to your project. So it helps to know which ones are high solvent and you just learn it through trial and error. Um, I can kind of tell you which ones I that work like super solvents or super eaters for me. Um, but then other people will say, no, I use that one just fine. There are some cuckoo birds. Um, the I call them cuckoo birds because the mother cuckoo bird flies to a robin's nest and she lays her eggs in the robin's nest. And then the stupid mother robin ends up raising that cuckoo bird as if it was one of her children. Um, so the cuckoo bird doesn't fit in the nest is the point. Um, they eventually get really big and eat all the worms and, and they crowd out the real robins. So you don't want a cuckoo bird in your nest. There are some cuckoo bird colors in the Copic system and Y17 is one of them. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever noticed that Y17 is darker than Y18 and Y19. Y17 doesn't belong in the family. The, the drunk Japanese guy slid it in there. It made sense at the time to somebody at the factory. They threw it in there. So every once in a while, there are cuckoo bird colors that don't fit in the family. And that's one of the things when I'm testing the markers, I will tell you in the write-up on the test results, I'll tell you there's a cuckoo bird color there. All right. So the E markers. What are the E markers? And everybody says E markers are brown markers. But what happened is, is that Copic knew that they only had room for 10 families of red. So what they did was they took the dirtiest red in their group 
the one that was the most desaturated, the most brownish of the source inks. And they just took it out of the red family and they moved it over there with the brown. And then they made room in the YR family. They took, which, which is a YR one here, E19. This one has been moved out of the orange family and put into the brown family. This marker here, E55, has been moved out of the yellow family into the brownish family. And that's why you've got these peach colors all the way down in the E99 section for the E90s. They were moved out of the YR family. They were just considered a little bit too dark, a little bit too dirty, so they moved them into the E family so that they could make a bigger set of YR markers. But these act more like YRs than they do E's, and that's why people have trouble tracking what do the E's mean, because one looks greenish. Um, E87 is one of those greenish colors because it kind of belongs in the green family. They all come from other families, but they were kicked out because they were a little bit too scummy to stay with all the pretty colors. So that's what the E family is. And then the grays are ink mixes. Um, the truest ink mix is the ends, and that's why they use that as the scale. But then they add a little bit of blue and they make the C's. They add a little bit of green or yellow, I'm not sure which. And that makes the W family. And then the toners are, um, they're a little warm, but not as warm as the W. So that explains the W family. So there's those cat, those, um, the, the different family groups there. Now, what I want you to take away from this is that I'm not a big fan of the cap math. Um, so that cap math is that you, if you want a blending partner for E55, you get the next number up, so like an E57, and the next number down, E53. That is the surefire way to color like everybody else, because everybody else is using Copic cap math too. Once you understand that this E marker actually came from the yellow family, then you might be more inclined to blend E55 with Y28, because we know that these guys are both yellow based. And these, these two actually make quite a nice little combination there. So you can start to move around those color families with more freedom when you drop the cat math thing. The cat math is a substitute for thinking and it's a substitute for experimenting. All Copic markers will blend with other Copic markers if you're on quality paper and if you give it enough juice. If I've got a glass full of blue ink and I pour some red ink into it, those two are gonna mix. They will mix just fine on their own. So they will mix on paper if you set up the right conditions. Experimentation is how you're going to develop your own artistic voice. So when you're looking at the blending combinations that I create for projects and you're looking and you're like, well, she's not using two, four, six or seven, nine, 10 kind of combinations. Um, that's because I'm choosing colors based on their colors and then I'm double checking the numbers just to make sure I don't have any chemistry problems going on there. But I don't pick colors based on the math because the math, it doesn't work for temperature. The math doesn't work for originality. The math doesn't work for when I'm looking at a realistic pink flower. Like if I'm looking at a rose, Cat math colors aren't going to get me the depth colors or the highlight colors. So cat math is great for beginners. It's great for people who aren't super serious about coloring. But if you're going to get into realism and you're going to get into that next level artistry, the cat math is going to hold you back. And that's kind of why I'm talking about this today is to explain what these numbers mean so that you can start experimenting and playing on your own because the artistry that is unique to you, your unique voice, comes from the way you play. Copying my recipe is always gonna make you a copy of me. So create your own blending combinations by playing with those colors. And I think people have better color instinct than they think they do. You can look, and I'm just gonna grab some blues randomly here. So I grabbed some non-family blues. I'm going to throw them with what's up here on my desk. So I've got these blues that I've just randomly thrown on here. We'll flip them over and look at the numbers of what I pick. 
at the end here. But you're a smart person. You can look at these colors and say, this is a dark blue. This is a dark blue. These are mediums. Maybe these are medium lights and that one's super light. You can classify your markers. You can say, well, this looks too green and I don't want a greenish blue. And this one looks too green. So maybe I'm gonna use this light blue and then this one looks like it might work really well there. I can do this. Maybe this one is too big of a jump, but this one looks pretty good. So what do I have here? I, I chose based on the cap colors, which can always be kind of dangerous because they're not totally accurate. But I have a B29, a B23, <laughs> a B21, and a B60. All right, so yeah. <laughs> I did not intend to come up with those, but look at how I matched those without knowing what they were. But we could do some substitution there. This is SB24, damn it. There we go, B66, B23. Um, let's throw a 9-1 in there. So that looks like a pretty good combination to me. And I'm not using the numbers to pick it. I was just going light, medium, dark, and this time I was deliberately trying to get something that looked a bit weird. So B66, B23, B2, B91. This was picked based on light, medium, and dark. And I can look at those last numbers and I know that six and then three and then one. So I am stepping down in the dilution rate. And um, if I had some washi tape on there to indicate that this wasn't a secret super eater, that would be really good too. And then try it out. So here's that B66. And here's the B23 and it's not blending super well on the first pass, but to be honest, this is hammer mill paper and I'm trying to get rid of it. So I just thought I would demonstrate on it. So this is never going to give me the great blending results. But that's a perfectly suitable blend there. Maybe that 2-3 is a little too warm in the center for my taste, but if you like it, go for it. And I didn't need any cap math to do that. Now, yes, blending the B66 with a B63 and a B60 that's a natural group. It's always because they're all made from the same source ink, they will blend better. But this is a more interesting and dynamic blend, which I would encourage somebody to try in a project. All right, so let me head up there to the top and just check out if there's any questions there. And I've blown through the 30 minutes long ago. All right, so, oh, thank you, Sherry says I look 25. I know I don't look 25. The gray hairs on my head are not 25, but <laughs> thank you for the flattery. Alex says, I'm pretty new to coloring, but I love the fine arts approach you have in love markers. I like coloring with realism. It's cool to see the end results. I'm going to go over here because I think I have the ability to throw these up on the side there. So people are telling me about... Um, where they got started from. Let me just try this. Yeah, Nancy says, I love the Christmas wreath. I've got this ability now. Yay, I added this feature this morning for the Q&As. All right, so, and I agreed totally with Alex about this, that Olo has a good numbering system. It makes a lot of sense. It's different than the Copic numbering system, but I like what they're doing there, and I'm really eager to um, see how they expand their color palette. Right now, it's a little too small for me to teach with it, but I am watching Olo, watching to see what they do. Uh, Nancy, good question. Where do the fluorescent markers fit in? So fluorescence, um, it'll be, you know that something is wrong. The body snatchers have taken over if Amy is coloring with the fluorescence, but here they are. I bought them exclusively to test them for that testing series. Do not use them. So um, where they fit in <clears throat> is they're telling you the group that they are in. So this is a YR marker. That F in front tells you that there is a fluorescent add additive added to it. It's that day glow powder that you see sometimes for sale um, online. So that F is just telling you that it has that day glow additive added to the mix. So this FY belongs in the Y family, but it's got the fluorescent additive. YG, another, um, there's two YGs, 
with the fluorescent add- additive one and two. And I think I read somewhere, it could have just been rumor, but I think I read somewhere that they were canceling one of these. It does seem like they're downsizing their, their colors just a little bit. I don't know for sure. So don't take that to the bank. This is in the violet family with the fluorescent additive. This is in the blue green family. Um, there are some characteristics just seeing this FRV one here. Um, the red additive d- tends to make inks a little bit more stubborn to blend with. So that's another thing that you should watch out for when you're making those combinations is that if there's red ink in the mixture, it does tend to bond to the paper a little bit more and get a bit stubborn. Annette says she's a big fan of the underpainting option. Yes. So the underpainting is something that I do. Um, and I will just quickly, uh, what can I underpaint here? Um, what I was finding was that as I moved from, um, watercolor bases and I was doing more, um, marker stuff within the colored pencil on top, I wasn't finding the colors I need. So the deep darkest part of, the bowl here. That's a color Copic doesn't make. Um, and I wasn't finding enough desaturated colors. So I went back to, okay, what did we do at school when we didn't have the color that we wanted? And we underpainted with things or you mixed things. So it's borrowed directly from oil painting classes. It's borrowed from classical oil painting technique. So it's me trying to make markers that Copic doesn't make. So here is a B two, three, and then for underpainting, let's say I don't have the violet that I want, I can put blue underneath it and I'm getting a slightly darker um, violet there, here. Now because I'm underpainting with blue here, it, the color is gonna stay pretty clean, but see, right in there, I'm creating a color that Copic doesn't make. It's a combination of B66 and V17. So this is where it started at. But um, if you compliment, if you do complement colors, you can start to get some of the gray, grungy, dingy colors. Um, one of my favorite underpaints, the one that tends to um, shock people the most, is just when you put a nice violet. So here's a nice light violet and put that underneath a pretty ye- little yellow and you start, ooh, start to get a um, Copic kind of shade color. So that's a little, that was a V triple zero. Let's try V01 and see if we can get something a little bit stronger. So if I'm coloring a banana, I'm pulling out my violets to make that shady yellow color and that's where that underpainting works in and all my classes that I have involve that underpainting because I use it so much in my own work that it would be silly not to teach with it. All right so Zephyr Essence is asking which of the gray series would you say is the most versatile? I have sets A and B for Copics but I would like a set of grays for layering and neutralizing the colors that I have. So excellent point there. Um, The grays are a universal underpaint. So you can underpaint, this is C3, and you can put the C's underneath any color and start to get that grayed down to saturation. So um, best value for somebody starting out underpainting is to get a set of grays. Now the V5, this would work better under something that wasn't quite so dark, C3. At a certain point that top color gets too strong to see the color underneath but that's a nice little combination there. That's C3 underneath V25. And in general, that underpainting is always gonna be a couple steps lighter. All right, so Zephyr is asking, what is the best set? Should she get the C's or the N's or the T's or the W's? Take the T's completely off your radar. The T's back when I started with markers back in the 80s, the T's were already almost extinct at that point. What the T's match is the toner that is in a commercial copy machine that is at Staples or Kinko's. How many of you need to match the ink at Kinko's? I don't need to do that anymore. Once upon a time I did, but T markers, um, you could take those off the list. So don't even buy them. Um, I've never had a, a situation where I was like, 
really need a tea marker for this. They're just not important. So save your money. Don't buy the teas. I think beginners should start with the neutrals because the W's are very warm. They're very greenish and they won't work really nicely underneath some of your blues and purples. Um, and the C's are very bluish. So if you use the, the C marker underneath the yellow right there, I'm kind of getting a little bit of a green hint to it. So start with those neutrals. Start with the neutrals and then branch out. I use the N's and the C's far more than I use the W's. So I would put those W's off as an extra purchase, unless you're somebody that colors a lot of fur, because then the W's come in handy. There's a lot of animals that have warm grays running through their fur. So, and I don't color animals, which is why I don't use the W's a lot. But I think in a lot of contexts, the W's look greenish and I find that unpleasant. So I, if I'm using a gray, 100% of the time, it's almost always a C. But if I'm teaching a gray, I tend to grab the ends because I know more students have them. But I think the ends are a good place to start with. Super balanced. Um, okay, so Dream Mill Arts, this is, uh, her name's Amy too. Um, she says, even though I've been coloring with you a long time, it's good to hear all of this again. Yeah, it's like a refresher course kind of thing. Oh, and thank you. She has a nice little endorsement there of me. Yep, Amy used to work with me as an assistant for a while, and um, that was great. And it was really clear at the time then that she needed to be doing more than assisting an artist. So I'm really glad to see that she's going on to art classes. Okay, so Alex is asking a follow-up on his earlier question. The difference between VO4 and VO5 because of the drunk guy. Yeah, um, okay, let me grab those two markers. VO4, and I think VO5 is on my desk here. Um, so, you know, these should go in order, right? And VO4 should be a little bit lighter. And, and this is VO5. So it, it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. This is the O4 and this is the O5. Sorry, I'm left-handed. So I tend to write, uh, I write up and down a lot like that. Maybe I'm Chinese at heart. Um, okay, so yeah, the difference there is the drunk guy. They work until they don't. They seem like they're from the same source ink, but one seems cooler and the other warmer. Um, and I'm gonna really quickly zip over here. I know it's not the most uh, riveting television here, but I'm gonna zip over to um, my website where I think I've tested both the VO4 and the VO5. So I'm going over to markernovice.com and I'm hitting Copic test results, and then I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom where the V's are, and I'm going to see if I have tested, because I think I've tested at least one of them, but probably both of them. Um, R's, T's, I've done the VO4. Okay, so if I'm looking at the test results, the VO4 doesn't shatter. Let me see if I can throw that up button on the screen. Woo, super big. But that actually, that's pretty good because it's showing you, see, that does not shatter at all. Um, and I think the VO5 would shatter. Here. Do, 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 do. Let me get rid of this. Again, this is not on the paper that I usually test shattering, but let's, let me explore this because I haven't tested, like I've got the test results, I just haven't written them up yet. I've done the light fastness result. This is all I do for the shattering. Okay, so this was the five and this was the four. And you can see how the ink is, see how it's starting to escape there. I watch it as it's moving. So yeah, these two are not from the same source ink, but they've been labeled because they were similar colors. Even when that dries, you're going to see that the center dot there looks totally different too. So they're not from the same source ink. One is a cuckoo bird and I think it's the five.
the spread isn't as big on the hammer mill paper. Different papers matter. They do change how your inks react. And that right there is a good sign because on Express It, I can get these really nice um, blooms when I test the shattering, but I don't get that on the hammer mill. I'm just trying to get rid of this paper. I needed it to test for paper evaluation and I ordered on Amazon and I thought I was getting just a ream of it. I ended up getting the, the double size. So I've got hammer mill out my ears. So Zephyr was thanking me for the answer to the question earlier. I appreciate your in-depth and informative answer. Just found me yesterday. Cool. That is the nice thing about YouTube is, um, is that I'm finding a whole new audience here. So uh, Penny is asking, what is shatter? So, so shattering is where you have a, an ink that is a composite. It's got two or even three different colors in it. So let me quickly show you a really good shatter. I'm gonna find a piece of Express It. Yeah. I have five million markers on my desk right now. And I'm going to put a non-porous surface underneath it because this will keep it wet longer. And then this is just regular colorless blender. And you can see, um, this is the fancy name is chromatography for this. I also do it with um, true chromatography paper. Now let me... There, that should be good. Now let me get the next darker marker. There. All right, so what we're looking at here is the difference between G99, which is a dark, murky kind of green, and a YG99, and they're not behaving the same way. This one is going to develop some bands of, you can already, already see it happening. See, there's kind of this golden color that's coming out here on the edge of the spread. This one stays more tight, but there's some golden colors coming out there. Both of these are telling you that they're not a pure source, that they've used more than one color. Um, and the shattering just, it reveals the, the ingredients that went in there. So remember, I told you there's always some exceptions to the rule. G family, um, there are a couple of single source inks, but this should technically be a YG. This was put into the green family, but it really behaves more like a YG. But see these other colors that are coming out of it and you can accidentally trigger this kind of reaction. And I've seen students do it when they're going back to um, fix an area and you just blend a marker with itself several times or with its next one down and you get the paper so saturated that all of a sudden you start to notice right on the edge there it's leaking gold and so you just need to know that some of these markers are going to shatter on you now there are blues that would never ever do that but there are some colors that are self shattering, where if you layer that ink enough times, it will shatter on its own. There's several BGs that will self shatter just from blending with itself. So you have to be careful when you're going back there and you're hitting something for the second or the third time. Um, because sometimes in self correcting, you can accidentally shatter those markers and you just kind of, you, like I said, it's 358 children and you just start to get to know them over time. And that's also, you're probably going to like to hear this from a bargain standpoint. I think the worst thing that an artist can do is go out and buy every color they ever made. So the worst thing a marker person can do is go buy all 358 at once because that's like adopting 358 kids. You're not going to remember their names. There's all these different personalities running around there and you're not going to learn them. Whereas if you start with a nice little core of markers, 
um, you learn those colors. And then once you know those colors really well, then you say, okay, I do need another blue combination. Maybe I need a cool blue combination because all I have is warm. So then you add gradually as your needs expand. And as you start to learn those markers, you can, you, you learn more. But if somebody dumps 358 on you all at once, you're never going to learn the similarities or the dissimilarities or the things that um, are unique about each one of those colors. So don't feel bad because you don't have a million dollars to go out and spend on Copic right away. It's the worst thing you can do to yourself because you'll never learn those colors as well as if you just grow your knowledge slowly over time. And Sylvia says, no idea about, she had no idea about shattering. Um, yeah, it's just something that I was like, okay, why is this happening? And then I, like, I would see it in my own stuff every once in a while because I do those non-traditional blending combinations. Um, but then I was seeing it in students. And that's one of the nice things about teaching locally is I can peek over your shoulder and watch what you're doing. And anytime that we worked with certain BG markers, they were getting shattering every time. And I'm like, what is going on here? Why is that not working? Because they're using the markers in a different way than I would, applying a ton of ink where I use very minimal amounts of ink. So it was just learning over time that, oh, this one is going to shatter on us and this one won't. But every single ink will do different types of um, shattering. And the shattering is different depending on the paper that you're working on. It really, um, paper is as good of an investment as the markers are. Lisa says, I'm one of those people who bought all 358. I wish I would have found you sooner and started with the starter recommendation list first. Um, yeah, I do have, um, if you subscribe to my newsletter, so you go to vanillaarts.com, you hit the subscribe tab in the menu up top, That'll get you an issue of the newsletter. And then in the newsletter, one of the benefits for it is there's a free download library. And you can get things like the color wheel that I had earlier that's in there for free. Um, and also in there for free is my starter marker list. And what that marker list is, is it's three reds that are useful, three pinks that are useful, three yellows that are useful for beginners. So if you're starting with absolutely nothing, it's 42 markers that you can shoot for. Now those are not the same 42 markers that I use in my beginner classes, but they are markers that I do use frequently. And I tested that list of 42 by teaching the local class um, with those 42. And that's, Lisa was part of that local class. So she had like every marker in the world and, um, but should, we were only using the same 42 markers over and over again every month in that class. Cause I was testing it to see, is this a good set of reds that is easy for beginners to blend and useful for more than one thing. So that's where that list of 42 came from, but it's not a class supply list. So if you're going to take one of my classes or you're going to take classes from another instructor, always buy the markers that are on your, that instructor's marker list because instructors in general will try and avoid giving you blends that do funky things. Whoop. All right. Pulled up Cynthia. There we go. Here we go. Sylvia says, same here. I don't have 358, but I do have too many. Yeah. Um, you could just put some away in a shoebox and not look at them for a while. Nancy has a similar experience, but hers is with the Olo. She bought all of the Olos at the same time, and I don't feel like I know any of them. Yeah, it's just, it's too much information to absorb all at once. And I think Nancy's probably like me where she's coloring a variety of things because um, I know Nancy does a lot of um, design team things. So one day you're coloring flowers and the next day you're coloring a puppy and that's a totally different set of markers. So you're constantly bouncing around from marker to marker to marker and you don't learn those three browns really well. And then you don't learn those three yellows really well. So yeah, I think overexposure. And I actually saw this in action. Um, there was an artist on YouTube who was given by a paint company. They, they mailed her every color they make. And I think it did some damage. If she had just been given 12 or 24, I think it would have, she would have learned faster. 
Alex asks, have you personally noticed refills going bad or changing color over time? Copic says they're good for three years. How long do you feel they can last? She's, he's thinking of buying some more. That is an excellent question. Copic does say that the shelf life is three years. I have personally not seen them changing color over time, but I don't keep mine out in direct sunlight. So let me show you. This is where, this is where most of my markers are in this cart that I've got all the inserts down there and then my work surface up here. Um, and I have, I still have a ton of the um, old bottles. So when they said that they were converting over to the smaller bottles, I went nuts and I bought a ton of these. And I think Lisa was with me at the time too and she purchased a bunch of them as well because I knew that the new bottles were smaller and so we just went nuts. We, we started collecting these like crazy. And they are now over three years old. And they're fine. I do notice that these are in a nice milky container. And then here's one that I haven't even opened yet. But these are in clear. And that's bad. So I think these are going to degrade faster than these. Because these are more protected from sunlight. But I don't keep them out in the open. They're not near a window. And there's usually something sitting there in front of them. But I have not personally seen a whole bottle do what you're describing, um, fading. I have seen that happen, though, with Tim Holtz Distress Ink Refill. I had a student that brought in um, several pinks, and she was like, what's wrong with these? And they had just faded in the sun, and it's because all dyes eventually do fade. So as long I would keep these out of direct sunlight, and they should be pretty good. Um, I'm not too worried about the three-year time limit. I think it's kind of a little bit of CYA on Copic's part there, um, making sure that they um, cover their butts in case it does fade. But it's all about how you store them. And I know when I took... I. I had been coloring for a while, but then when I wanted to start teaching, I did go and um, uh, Imagination International was still doing their Copic certification at the time. And I felt like if I'm going to be a teacher, I need to be official. So I went and took the Copic certification. I didn't learn anything, but it was interesting to talk to people and, um, and look at what they were doing with the markers. Um, anyway, when I took the Copic certification, um, the woman that was doing it was their top trainer, um, the one that had been with the company the longest. And she told a story about one of her kids buried one of the, her, the markers in a sandbox and it sat out in the sandbox for several years before she found it and it was fine when she got it back. So um, I think the three years is a little bit of CYA unless you've got him sitting out in the, in the light. I don't notice the ink breaking down or anything like that. Uh, Net says, it's taken me a number of years to collect all the colors. Yes. And honestly, I probably, I did not have a full collection until two years ago. Because I didn't have the toners. I didn't have the fluorescence. And I had some holes in the collection there. Um, so I worked... I taught and worked for a number of years without a full collection. And as a matter of fact, a lot of my collection I got because I was teaching at a store that wanted me to use colors that I didn't own. So they were like, okay, we'll just write this off as some expense there. So I was, I was growing my collection from there. But I started with a very small, very sturdy collection of about 60 markers and worked with that for a long time. Um, Nancy says, my refills are in a box in a closet, so they're not exposed to light, and I haven't noticed any difference. So, yeah, uh, Nancy's super experienced, too. So um, she's saying the same thing. I would trust Nancy. Um, Sandra is asking, I see you that, that you store your markers vertically. I'm new to markers, and somehow I thought I should be storing them horizontally. Does that matter? That is another one of those card making myths because card makers are used to, let me pull out, where is it? Okay. Card makers are used to working with pens like this. This is a pigment based pen. This is another one. This is a pigment based pen. This is a Posca. When it's pigment based, 
you do need to keep it horizontal because pigments are particles and particles will settle. But there is nothing to settle in a Copic marker. So you can store them horizontally. You can store them vertically. It doesn't matter. Um, mine are actually, th these cases have them on a... Um, on a um, slant and I have them, like I put it on camera laying down, but I have it sitting upright. So they, mine are stored horizontally, kind of di slightly diagonal most of the time. Um, and then when I'm using them, I put them into cups. So I don't have any markers in this because I put all the markers away just before filming. But I have these little, they're almost like frosting cups. It's actually what jelly roll pens used to come in in the store. And when I, I told you I worked at a store, so I every time they went through another jelly roll display, I would take the label off and take the container home. So I store my markers in here when I'm waiting to teach with them vertically. So it doesn't matter either way. Um, they're not gravity fed and there's nothing to settle. So you can store them horizontal or vertical. These guys will die if you store them vertical, but Copic isn't like that. It's not pigment based. Um, let's see. Nancy is relating some of her teaching experience. She says, I was told by my teacher that I had to have a full set if I was going to teach. I have markers that I've never used and would never have bought. Yep, exactly. Same thing. I have that toner set because I was testing, but I will probably, I've, I've never grabbed them to do anything other than test. Um, you know the colors you like, and those are the colors you will tend to work with. So start with the colors that you find popping up often in the images that you color. So if you color florals most of the time, or botanicals, you're going to need a wide range of greens and start with those greens. And then as you need some more colors, then you add those into your collection. And that way it's always a useful collection to you because the markers that I use most are not gonna be the markers that you might use most. If you color puppies all the time, you're gonna have a hard time dealing with my botanical set because most of the time I color flowers and um, that type of thing. I don't do a lot of skin and hair. So if you're coloring people all the time, you need a good collection of skin colors. Um, so you know what you like, you know what you're going to tend to work with. I could tell you that um, BV66 is one of my favorite colors, but if you don't like that color, you're not going to use it very much unless you find a purpose for it. So I, really the ideal world is... I, you don't need 358. I'm, I'm proof of that. I didn't have 358 until two years ago. Um, and again, once again, the only reason why I bought them is to test them. And I've seriously considered selling them, except that I'm always telling people not to buy toner markers. So why am I selling the toner markers? <laughs> um, but yeah, the best collection is going to be one that is unique to you. And I know that it hurts because you look at that 70, that set of 72 or that set of 36 and you're looking at the price per marker, but you're buying markers that you will probably never use. And that was a problem that I ran into because I was like, I want to start working from home a little bit more and not working at work. So I thought I'm going to buy a set of 72. So I bought a box of 72. And the freelance project that I was working on was for a seed company. And I was doing the cover, I was doing the label art for a set of daisies. So I needed to color specific daisies. And I bought that box of 72 and I didn't have a single color for the daisies. So I had to drive to work and borrow the markers and come home. So that box of 72 is a great value if you use those markers, but if you need other markers. So I laid out, it was almost like $200 at the time. And I had to call Copic on the phone and say, yes, please, I'd like the box, set box B. Can you mail that to me? That's how I had to order them. So I had to wait by the mailbox for two weeks for it to arrive. And then I was already late on the project. And then I had to drive back and get the more, more colors. The, the saddest thing is when somebody comes to me and they say, okay, I'm ready to start your classes. I have set A. And I don't use any of the colors from set A. Uh, Jacqueline says, Copic has these storage containers that are ver vertical. So I figured they had to be flat or Copic storage would keep, would not keep them flat. Okay, so Copic is, um, 
They're not consistent. I have watched a store that did big volume Copic business and the boxes that came in from the UPS guy did not say this end up. So that means that that box was turned onto different sides all the way from Japan, got flipped and flopped all the way through there. Some of Copic's storage in the stores, like this is one of, like I told you, this is one of their commercial sets and this is designed to be upright. So this is horizontal storage, but think about those trios that hang on a hook. The trios hang upright, they hang vertical. So Copic is not consistent. So I figure if Copic doesn't care to mark their boxes this end up, then it doesn't matter. But also I'm married to a product engineer and, and he's, he's taken Copics apart for me for different reasons. And he says, yeah, there's no reason why you would keep them vertical or horizontal. Annette is asking, any advice, advice on how to use Prismacolor pencils with Copic markers? Well, that is what I am all about. Um, I could talk for hours on that, um, and I won't. Um, that's we'll, We will cover that in another one of these, but I have free live streams and free videos where you can see me mixing them all the time. Um, I will say that the most important thing when you go to mix the pencils with the Copic markers, the reason why I use Prismacolor is because they will stick to marker paper. A lot of the more expensive brands of colored pencil will not stick to the paper that is friendliest to your markers. So it doesn't do you any good to buy light fast pencils because Copics are not light fast. And it doesn't do you any good to buy expensive pencils in a big set because the Prismacolor are cheaper and they're stickier. So um, that is why I use Prismacolor, but I like Prismacolor. They're, they're a good pencil for what they are. So don't feel like you have to go out and buy the best because that's actually not the best. The paper that you work on is super important. So you need something that's a little bit toothy for the colored pencil and a little bit smooth for the markers. Amy says, I have vertical storage rack like Amy has. I used to store my markers with the brush side down, but I started having ink gushes. Now I store them chisel side down without issue. Um, yeah, I've never personally had an ink gush. Um, like, and what she means is, um, okay, you need to clarify for me, Amy, because do you mean, because I thought you meant at first, See how down in there, there's a little bit of ink around the side where I've bumped the side, but I've never opened up a vertical stored marker and found a big puddle of ink down in the bottom. That has never, ever, ever happened to me. Um, yes, I do occasionally have volcanoes that happen, but I don't think it's related to how they're being stored. And that's just you're coloring along and all of a sudden the marker just kind of vomits all over the paper. I think that's what Amy might be talking about. Um, Nancy says, have I tried polychromos with Co Copics? Do they work with the paper? They do not. They're too firm. And that's the one brand I, and I know students walk in and they think I'm going to impress the teacher because I've got the polychromos, but they don't stick to express it. There's very little, uh, colored pencil brands that will stick to express it. I moved to Bristol for the extra tooth when I'm adding the colored pencils. So then you can work with polychromos. Um, but yeah, I, I don't love the polychromos. <laughs> uh, me and Hammer Mill and polychromos. Not friends. <laughs> and I know that uh, Nancy was working on Hammer Mill for quite a while, for a while there too. Sandra says, I only have the markers required for the blend and flutter by. So those are two of my classes. The blend is a 12 week be basic beginner. And then flutter by is a like two hour basic um, beginner. I would like to have some greens as well. So maybe the shamrocks would be next. Um, from my uh, beginner list, I can tell you what that is right now. My recommended beginner markers. I like the YG03 because it's super friendly and it blends with everyone. And then I pair that with a YG17. And then I usually put either B32 or B30, 
B23 will work under this, but um, this would be a standard beginner blend that I would use in my classes. I always use that 03 because it's super friendly. The YG17 works really well with it. And then we always put a blue underneath it. So if you're looking for a green expansion, um, if you're gonna take a green class, then get what I'm using or get what the instructor's using. But if you're just going out for your own personal use, you can't go wrong with that particular blend right there. That's an excellent beginner combination. Um, the B32 is another one that you could use instead of the B23. So that's what this one would look like. And we use those like interchangeably as beginner blends. And I will show you exactly what that looks like. So this is Express It. And here is the B32. And I'm glad you guys are asking questions because this is what I wanted these Q and A's to be like. So you can barely see that um, under paint underneath there, but it is darkening it a bit. And there's that beginner blend. As a beginner, um, I would avoid the G's. The G's in general are harder to blend. There's something a little bit stubborn in those. And I could, you could take all of my green markers away and I would probably not notice it. Just leave me the Y G's and I'd be good. Kelly says, I'm so glad I found you in your fountain of knowledge and teaching style. It's not for everybody because, you know, sometimes I say things that people don't agree with. So, <laughs> but, you know, if if I've observed it, then it's probably something that um, other people have observed, too. So I really do believe in being honest about things that um, there are things that do not work with me and all the time and all the talent and all the skill isn't going to make a bad marker not blend or a bad, make a bad marker blend. So we need to be honest about that because a lot of people figure, oh, I'm just not good at it. No, it's just you're on the wrong paper or you're using a stubborn marker. There's always an answer for it and it's not usually you. Sandra says, thanks so much on the tip on the green, for the tip on the greens. The YG03 and B32 are in my set. Yep. Okay. So then get the YG17. And if you want another marker that can go well into that, another one that we add to it is YG67. So this shows up in some of my beginner classes. And then in that case, we step this up to a 34 because the 67 takes a little bit more. But the 67 is really nice. I don't love 63 but 67 fits in really well with this combination. And here that is. If you're somebody that loves to have threes, I always color dark to light. So you'll see me doing that. See the 67 just adds a little bit more. And then if you put the 20 or the 34 underneath it, which I can't find it's somewhere on my desk here. Oh no, here it is. Here's that 34. I have so many markers out. That underpaint doesn't have to read really strong. I find that beginners don't like to see the underpaint. They like it. They like to pretend it's not there. As you get into the more advanced classes, then I really get you going with color that you can obviously see. So this one has the 67 involved if you need that slightly darker green. But it's a nice happy green that... Um, it's on my set of 42 there that people have been coloring with for a long time. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to make sure that we cover. Um, I wanted to answer as many questions as people had. Um, I think we will try and do this again in another two weeks or like every other week. And um, I'll come up with a new topic for that one. I need to think about it. A little bit on the spot here um, but I'll set the topic for it and then we'll just kind of riff on that um, let's see Kelly says I oh I only have Copic cool warm and neutral grays glad I found you before buying actual colors oh so you just have nothing but grays okay yeah um so what you're going to do is you're going to start finding like you're going to decide that eye color I color X most often and then start to think about the colors that you would use for that. Cause I'm assuming you're not like totally new to color. Um, and you're going to um, then build off of. So if you use something all the time in colored pencil, 
buy it in Copic. And I do that. Um, I took a look at the watercolors that I was using and that's the watercolor paints that I was using most often. Um, and then started building the Copics off of that. Alex says, using Expressit, some markers release more ink than I want. Do you think it's because of the markers might be overfilled? Some of them are stock, so they're 14.5 plus grams. Or do some markers just behave differently? Um, okay, so that's all about the ink flow, and you're right. So I am surprised that you have markers that are over that. Um, he's talking 14.5 grams. Um because that's the old numbers. Copic doesn't fill them that full anymore. Copic used to fill their markers. It's kind of a, mm, okay, here I'm being honest again. Copic used to, and I know this because I went to the store and I opened up a brand new box of freshly shipped markers and I put them all on the scale and I weighed. And Copic used to fill all their markers to 14.6 grams. It was almost dead across the board. Um, some of the darker colors actually weighed a little bit more than that. And I think it's because colorant weighs more than solvent, but that used to be their total. As of 2019, Copic has kind of, you know, shrinkflation um, and they now only do 14.0 grams. So um, your, your brand new markers are coming from the factory, almost a half gram less. And I use a half gram to color like this cutting board. That's probably a half gram right there. So your, your markers are coming from the factory now, one project short. Actually, I've got a video coming up about this topic soon. <laughs> But as far as, um, so Alex is asking about the ink flow. So I think what you're noticing is that Expressit keeps the ink on the surface of the paper longer. So here's Hammerbill and here's Expressit. And if I put the same green line, you're not going to see the difference on camera, but you will feel it as you're coloring. Hammer Mill is sucking the ink down into the paper fibers. Expressit designed for use with Copics, specifically for blending. It keeps the ink on the surface longer. So what you're feeling is that wetter surface, I think. It's not that your markers are releasing more ink, it's that you're using a less sucky paper, if that makes sense. Two ways to interpret that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, you're noticing that the ink sits on the surface longer, but that allows better blending, it allows for self-blending, and that is one of the reasons why I put it on a non-absorbent surface too, because the worst thing that a beginner can do is color with scrap paper underneath. It dries your paper out faster, dries your ink out faster. So I don't think it's actually your markers. I think you're just feeling the difference in the paper. Um, the Expressa is super smooth too, so it feels wetter. Um, but it also could be um, when you press harder. Okay, so this is just a fast low pressure line. If I press harder, I'm getting a darker mark because I'm squishing more ink into the paper or if you go slower. So it could also be just subtle variations in the amount of pressure or the speed that you're using. Yes, <laughs> totally true. <laughs> I I just, it was recommended by so many people and I cannot get it to blend. It's just, look at this um, right here. That did not blend and it would have on Express It. I think you, I think ham, Hammer Mill makes people look stupid because it doesn't self blend. You really have to work at it. And I'm sure that over time I could develop a Hammer Mill technique, but yeah, wow. And I know that a lot of beginners say, well, but the Expressa is super expensive. I think you're using more money to color on Hammer Mill than you are on Expressa because I don't have to go back and blend. I didn't have to go back and blend this three times. So I'm saving money on ink by buying more expensive paper. Here, I'm going to have to go back and use a ton of ink to get that to blend. So I don't think the cost savings are really there. Plus, there's the whole thing about feeling stupid. When you're on a paper that doesn't want to blend, 
and you see that it's not blending, you don't blend the you don't blame the paper. You blame yourself. And that makes coloring not fun and that makes you quit faster because you don't see good results. So why keep doing this cuz I must not be a talented person. That is a really big factor for beginners. If you're not enjoying the process, if you're struggling to get good results, and if you're looking at Sally Sue online, who's doing Express It, and she says, oh, blending is a breeze. You're like, well, this just isn't the hobby for me. It's not you. It's not your skill. It's the paper. So I just, I think the cheap paper is a real death trap for a lot of beginners. Okay, so I think I've gone through most of these questions here and who knows how long I've been talking here. Almost two hours. Oh my goodness. But you know, if you're getting some value out of it, then that's fine. <laughs> All right, so I hope you understand a little bit more about the Copic blending system. The real moral of the story is, is that the math doesn't work. It doesn't work for everybody. If you're just doing simple cards, math is fine. But the cat math, it just... There's more holes in it than you expect. And the whole temperature thing, like Alex brought up, and the, the, the cap doesn't keep you in using all warm blues together or all warm greens together. And when you start clashing those temperatures, then your coloring doesn't look good. And you know, often people don't know why. So um, yeah, the moral of the story is that the, the, the caps are just there to guide you about the chemistry of what's going on inside the markers but it's not they were not designed to create blending combinations that was added on to it's been kind of grafted onto an old numbering system that makes a lot of sense when you look at it from the chemical standpoint from chemistry the numbers make perfect sense but when you look at it from the blending combination kind of thing it, it just doesn't quite fit because it was grafted on there by people 20 years after the marker had been invented so um, don't, don't stick to it. You've got more color instincts than you think. And the more you use your color instincts, the better they get. And you'll never get develop those color instincts by just doing cap math all the time. So yay, I am so glad that this was helpful for people. Um, once the chat shuts down, you can take this conversation over to the comments below. I do read all the comments. I don't have that many people commenting yet on my videos, so I do read every comment and I will answer questions over there in the comments. So if you're watching this on the replay or after the stream is done, go ahead and ask some questions. And remember, your questions will help me decide what the next topic will be. So I learn a lot by knowing what kind of things you want to know about. We can talk about paper. We can talk about the numbering system that would be best to keep that all in one area but and then i also have a facebook group where i will answer questions if you ask them over there so it's called vanilla arts chat and you can search for that and you have to answer the questions to be admitted and that way we don't get any bots or um, advertisers in there um, and i do ask that we keep the conversation there dedicated to copics and colored pencils and vanilla arts projects but you can ask questions about how the markers work or whatever because that's all within the topics that we talk about all right so i think we will um cut this off here super glad that this was helpful for everybody and um i am looking forward to seeing some color experiments from people who no longer have to do the cat math so all right, everybody, happy coloring, have a great day, and I will talk to you in a couple of weeks. Okay, bye.